Greetings, everyone. I'm Scott Rodell here at the Great River Dallas Center. And in this episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship, we're going to look at a pair of Demon Slayer swords or Demon Slayer Gen. Now, I know fans of anime out there just realized that that was a big clickbait, but I couldn't resist because I love that anime. And these swords have an inscription that say Demon Slayer, or more literally, they say Tsumo Long Chen. Tse means to stab or thrust or kill, and Mo is demon. So this is a, a demon killer sword. And the bottom here it says Lung Chen. Lung Chen, of course, is the famous area where swords were forged in China. So this is a, a demon slayer sword from the famous Lung Chen Forge. So before we get into what that inscription probably really is about, let's just talk about some of the uh, specifications for these two gen. This one is a fairly long gen. It's 30 and a half inches long, which is 77 centimeters. Has a good weight, pound and a half, 690 grams. So really gives a, gives a pretty solid cut. Not the most powerful cut you can get with a gen, but definitely if you're coming with a quick P cut, it will definitely deliver a solid cut. One of the things that's interesting about this sword or different than the standard is the point of balance is fairly far forward. It's, it's pretty much like a Dao would be. It's at 20 centimeters out from the base of the guard. 17, maybe even a little less, maybe 16 and a half, 16 would be more typical for a gen of this length. Uh, but that shows you how there is definitely some variation historically that makes it also handle a little differently. For some types of deflections, like here it does feel a little bit tip heavy. If you're coming from a die into a toe kind of cut, when you want to make this turn, it fights back a little bit. Again, it feels and plays a bit more like you would expect the Dao, the Chinese saber to handle, but it's not uh, terrible. It's not that I can't handle it. It's just not what you really find to be sort of more standard and it would be quicker and easier to wield. Uh, I've handled a fair number of these over the years and they've all been balanced that way. So wherever the maker was of these swords, this is how in that region or that, that forge, this is how they made their swords and how they balanced them. The other thing I think that is really interesting about both of these swords is that they were common. Now, that may sound kind of odd to say that what's interesting about swords is that they were common, but I think this really speaks to a common misconception about Chinese swords, particularly the Jin, which is that they were all individually made, that you, you know, the sword was made for the swordsman. That is not the case. If you think about this like, like a suit, if you're a businessman, if you have an office job, the average guy, when he needs a suit, he goes to the department store, tries on a few so suits off the rack, finds one he likes at a price he can afford, and that's the suit he buys for a few hundred bucks. If you're a wealthy executive, you go to a tailor, you have made of a very different kind of cloth, you have a very fine suit made just for you, and he pays thousands of dollars for that. So just like suits, swords were the same. There were forges that produced swords in large numbers, and these were, you could consider them sort of the off-the-rack kind of sword, and the vast majority of swordsmen had these sort of off-the-rack swords. Very few were made individually for a specific swordsman, although those certainly definitely did exist. The ones you see in museums, the fine examples, usually are those kinds of swords, and that sometimes creates this misconception that that's what all the swords were like. Uh, the shorter sword, the, the Stuanjian variation, has only a 50 centimeter blade, which is about 20 inches and weighs 430 grams. So typical for a short sword. It's not particularly heavy. That's only uh, 15 ounces, not even quite a pound. It plays and feels a little bit more like a long dagger. It's not as, as robust as many other uh, Duanjian are, but it's still really quite a weapon. Both of these swords are made of really good steel that are well-tempered uh, with hard edges and no question would function well in combat. That's what they were made for. So what about these inscriptions now? What about this Tsumo Long Chen inscription? What is that really about? Uh, and there's a, three things come to mind. One is, and I think it's not an unreasonable idea, is that these are for Taoist ritual. Uh, with that inscription, you might think so, but 
I don't. Uh, I don't. I think it's maybe a good guess, but probably not the answer, because when you see Taoist swords, they tend to be wider and shorter, and they're for rituals, so you, they need to be seen. You don't want such a long, thin blade. When you're performing a ritual, whether it's at a Taoist altar or at somebody's home, you probably don't want such a long blade. You want a shorter blade. So Taoist ritual swords usually are made of very good steel, same kind of steel that combat swords are made of, you know, same same construction, same good tempering, heat treating, but they tend to be shorter and wider. So this sword is really one, I think, forged to be used in combat, either as dual or maybe even as a, even when it's being carried as a symbol of authority, it still is a functional weapon. The second possibility is that they were perhaps used for feng shui, which of course somewhat relates to, to, to the Taoist kind of aspect, and it might have been used for that uh, in certain circumstances. Swords are used in feng shui, not very commonly, but they are definitely used in feng shui sometimes, and perhaps if somebody felt their, their home had a malignant spirit, a sword like this might have been used with some incantations to protect the home. So I think that's another possibility. But I think what's far more likely is that these swords date from, and I think they're right period time-wise, to the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping Rebellion was from 1850 to 1864. And the Taiping Rebellion was led by uh, uh, Hong, who, uh, what we would call him today, really be a cult leader. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion was a very odd kind of period in Chinese history. And this, uh, their emperor, Hong, he literally believed that he was Christ's younger brother. And it was his role in society, his mission, to drive the demons, the Manchus, out of China and establish this heavenly kingdom. And I've found a number of swords over the years that clearly date to the Taiping Rebellion that had this Tsumwa inscription on them. So I think it's far more likely that these swords were from that period, from that, that middle of the 19th century Taiping Rebellion, and that these demon slayer swords were literally to drive the demons out of China, the Manchu people out of China, at least in the uh, minds of the people who were part, remember the part of the Taiping Rebellion. So, uh, so they're very interesting kind of swords to me as a practitioner because they are these off-the-rack sort of swords. They're swords that people would have used that they, right? And they were a kind of sword that a more common kind of person, somebody, of course, of some rank and status, they had to have the money to buy a good sword, but not of the top level. So I think as a practitioner, I find that really interesting. This is a sword that somebody would have bought to use not just to wear to show off that they were, had a certain rank and status in society. If you compare them, though, you'll see that it's very obvious that they were made in large numbers. If, for example, we look at the fittings, the fittings are exactly the same. There's no difference between the two models at all. Uh, if we compare the inscriptions on the blade, it has the exact same si mo lung tren on both sides. The opposite side on both have a dragon, and I've seen, like I said, I've seen a number of these over the years and handled them. They all have these angular, very angular, pointy kind of tips. They all have the exact same dragon. So these are clearly made in large numbers. If you look at the pommels, the pommels are exactly the same. And the two guards are very close, very similar, but they are both cast, which means they were made in large numbers. These are not individually carved out uh, Piece, uh, fittings. They are all cast made in large numbers. So, very interesting swords, particularly for the practitioner. An interesting piece of Chinese history, Demon Slayer Gem. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship. If you did, we always appreciate the thumbs up and a subscription. Please tell us what else you'd like to see in the future. If you've got comments or other thoughts about these swords, please leave us a note. We'd love to hear back from people. And please do also check out that link for the Academy of Chinese Swordsmanship if you're at all interested in learning how to wield a sword like this. Thanks again and zaijian!